Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I wanna cover network engineer interview questions on the behavioral side of the network engineering interview spectrum. I'll make another interview video that is related to the network engineer technical interview side. So there's two sides of every network engineering interview and I wanna cover both sides because this is extremely important for you guys to succeed to be able to pass your network engineering interviews because a lot of people don't study for their interviews, they waste their time, they don't really know how to interview properly. So I'm going to have for behavioral network engineer interview questions sent out to me and I'll be able to, and I want to show you how I'm able to answer these technical network engineering sorry behavioral network engineering interview questions this is going to give you a sneak peek of how I'm able to sound during my interviews and just to give you an example of the best way of, of answering a technical or behavioral network engineer question so let's go ahead and let's dive into this so I'm gonna right now ask a question um, and then I'll just respond to it, okay? Tell me about a time you diagnosed a complex network issue. How did you isolate the root cause? Awesome. So you asked basically, tell me about a time how I um, fixed a complex network issue and then how I, did I identify the root cause? So first of all, um, there was a time back at my old company where um, there was an issue where there was an issue with spanning tree and a particular device, it was causing broadcast storms and multiple devices on that particular network. And as you know, when it comes to a broadcast storm, that is because of a loop on a layer two network. As you know, that was the issue. And I first had to identify that issue because when it comes to network engineering, as you know, the most important thing is first to identify the issue, right? The last thing you want to do is solve a problem that you know, it's not that's not the problem. So what I did to identify the issue is I went into the devices, I looked at the configurations, I looked, I ran a couple of show run commands and I seen a lot of packets being sent out and I seen a lot of packets just looping over and over again. So then that's where I identify that spanning tree was not properly configured. So once I figured out that spanning tree was not properly configured, I went ahead and added the correct commands to do that. I went through the whole process with change management to make sure that uh, the change was valid and okay to do. And obviously this wasn't causing, you know, tremendous um, outage throughout our network. So I wanted to make sure that this issue was resolved as quick as possible. But once I first identified the issue, um, then I went in and looked at the configurations, verify that that, that was the act actual issue. Since this was, this is a common issue that I've dealt with before. In this particular case, I didn't go ahead and ask the senior engineer because I've done this issue multiple times and I've resolved it quite uh, quite many times. However, this was my first time ever doing this particular issue. I would definitely look for a senior level engineer uh, who's seen this particular issue before, before I go ahead and resolve the issue. So that's kind of how I would go about doing this sort of situation. So let me know if that answers your question. And if not, I can elaborate a little bit more. So that's kind of how I would go about answering it. Sometimes you want to give more context and more details. Uh, another thing you can do, obviously I'm, this, I'm talking to an AI, so I don't have like any answers or any follow-up questions I can ask. But one thing I would do is I would ask follow-up questions like, hey, do you guys uh, have any spanning tree issues in your particular network? Have you worked with spanning trees or have you dealt with the issue like that before? Tell me about a time how would you like how would you solve a particular outage those kind of questions are really good to follow up after your answer and it's not like i said there's nothing wrong with asking questions after you've been asked a question during an interview it's totally fine it's actually extremely helpful to do so that's the first one now we're going to go ahead into the second one all right so here is the second question so let's go ahead and listen give an example of a time you had to explain a technical networking concept to a non-technical stakeholder awesome well, yeah, thank you so much for that question. So first of all, as we know, as network engineers, we always have to deal with stakeholders who are non-technical. Um, and as a network engineer, I always take precedence and understand that that is a, an important, we have an important responsibility to convey the information to a non-technical stakeholder uh, for a variety of reasons. Because at the end of the day, um, the way I like to communicate with someone who I believe is non-technical, first of all, I would ask them, hey, are you a network engineer? Or I would see what their title is. If I assume they're not network engineering, I would explain a concept in the most bare bones, the most simplest way possible for them to understand it without being confused. Because the last thing you want a non-technical stakeholder to understand um, or to not understand is to be in a position where they are trying to solve an issue or you're trying to solve an issue. Maybe it's an outage and you're trying to explain it to them and you give them the heavy details that doesn't make sense. All they care about is the high level things, is the issue solved, how many customers are impacted, whatever needs to be understood at that point. That is kind of how I would explain it in a manner that is extremely bare bones. I'm not going to explain the details of like subnetting or IP address. I would just explain, hey, it's not working for this particular reason. We've solved this issue before. We're going to go ahead and resolve this issue as soon as possible. Because that's what people want to hear. People want to hear what they can understand. And the last thing you want to do is frame in a manner that it just 
completely doesn't make any sense. And if anything, you left them even more confused than before the conversation you had with that individual. So that's kind of how I would go about answering it. But like I said, it depends on the level of technicality on that particular individual. Some you know stakeholders may have higher levels of technicality. So maybe I can go into more further detail to explain some of those technical concepts. But if they aren't as technical, then I would just kind of tone it a little bit back and just give them the bare bones of what they need to be able to understand it. So, um, and it's totally fine to do that. I'm big on doing that. I've, I've spoken with multiple stakeholders who are non-technical and I try to explain it in a manner that, you know, they, they would understand and it's not to mitigate or to make them feel bad or make them feel dumb, but it's just to have effective communication at the end of the day, because if you're not able to effectively communicate your message, even if you are explaining it technically and you think that's the right way, at the end of the day, that particular stakeholder is going to be confused and that's actually the wrong way of doing going about things. So I like to tone it back based off where their level of technicality is and just to get the conversation going and moving to the next step, right? So that's kind of how I would do it. It really just depends on the individual. So hopefully that answers your question. And um, if you don't mind me asking at this particular company, are, are we going to be speaking with uh, stakeholders who are non-technical? Who, who are they? So that's kind of how I would answer that particular question. So as you can see, you see how I asked that follow-up question at the end? to kind of add a discussion, right? Because for them to ask a question like that, that particularly means that there probably is gonna be stakeholders uh, or coworkers or people that you're gonna be working with that you're going to have to be able to communicate effectively in that manner. So it's good to ask that particular question there and just to get the conversation flowing and to kind of put less pressure on yourself and more pressure on the person who's interviewing you. And, and, and also it's, there's nothing wrong with asking questions during the side where they're asking you technical questions because when it comes to an interview, I get it, it, it is scary, but make it as much as a conversation as possible. That way your interview can be memorable and that's going to give you the highest likelihood of you finding a position, right? Because, or you getting the position, because if you're forgettable, they're just gonna forget about you and move on to the next candidate. So that's the second question. Let's go ahead and move on to the third one. All right, so I have the third question. So let's go ahead and listen up to it and let's give an answer. Describe a situation where you had to troubleshoot a network outage under pressure. All right, so as you know, as a network engineer, I've in my years, I've had to troubleshoot multiple network outages that you know had multiple customers impacted. And as a network engineer, I believe that I have to make sure I take the responsibility on myself to be able to fix a particular outage. So um, there was an outage back um, in my first couple of years as a network engineer. And um, basically the IP address was incorrectly configured by a fellow engineer. And that caused a duplicate IP, which caused a network outage where customers were not able to connect into the backbone router. So this was a really big outage because a lot of customers were impacted. And, you know, during this time, you know, your manager is kind of like overseeing you. And he was asking me like, hey, can you fix this outage? I was like, sure, I, I would love to go ahead and take a take a stab at it. But he, he, he made sure to, to let me know that this is a very time sensitive issue. So I understood that this being time sensitive, I had other work going on. I wanted to prioritize this particular outage. So I went ahead and looked at the issue and I, you know, while as a network engineer, I made sure to be as cool, calm and collected because the last thing I want to do is be frantic. My hand is shaking and unable to make any changes because of my, me being afraid to make a change or me making a mistake by being afraid. So I understand that moving fast is obviously appropriate or moving fast is needed, but you don't want to move too fast to the point where you're making mistakes or you're making the wrong decision. So I like to make very cool, calm, collected decisions. I don't like to, to be frantic. I like to be focused. I like to ask the right questions. And I, during that particular outage, I made sure I looked at what was causing the outage and I seen that it was that wrong IP address configured. So I went ahead and I changed the IP address to the right subnet. And as soon as I made that change, I verified the changes and made sure it looks good. And obviously that was a high pressure environment because you know there's multiple stakeholders waiting for you to fix that particular issue. And this was on a bridge call with multiple people on the call asking, hey, when is it gonna be done? And I made sure to communicate effectively with those other stakeholders on that particular call to give them the understanding that I am working on the issue and I completely understand that what you guys are going through. And I have found the issue and I'm gonna go ahead and implement the change right now to fix the the particular issue. So I went ahead and fixed that particular issue. And once that issue was resolved, I asked the stakeholders to verify that for them. And as I already verified myself, and once it was all good to go, I made sure to stay on the call for any questions or concerns in case anything happens during that time. But as I know, as we know, as a network engineer, it is important to stay calm because these outages are important for you to resolve. The last thing you want to do is be frantic and afraid to even make a change 
uh, and, and be in that sort of situation. So that's kind of how I deal with it. It, it is part of the, the, the life of a network engineer and I accept that. And I kind of like being under that pressure because it forces you to be focused and, and actually it time goes by very slow during that time. So I actually enjoy it and I, you know, it's just kind of my thing. So if that, if, is this something that you guys do on day to days or really big outages that you guys work on that causes you to be in high pressure environments? And if so, like, how do you deal with it yourself? So that's kind of how I would answer that question right there. So for this particular question, it is a, like I said, it's, it's asking about troubleshooting. So I added some technical concepts in there, but then this is a behavioral interview. Um, I'm going to make a whole nother video on the technical interview, which is going to be a lot more sauce, but this is more behavioral. So I'm going to go ahead and get a couple more questions here, maybe two more. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. All right. So let's get on to the next question. Have you ever had to implement a new networking technology? How did you approach it? Awesome. Yeah. Well, as a network engineer, I've had to deal with new technologies all the time. And actually, when I first became a network engineer, I was heavily on Cisco. And you, me being a Cisco guy, I only knew Cisco and going, joining this new company, they were very big on Juniper. And I wasn't really sure about Juniper. I was kind of didn't have an understanding of it. I never worked with Juniper myself, but I understand that if I have an understanding of Cisco, I'm pretty sure there is going to be similarities within the Juniper space. So during that time, I went ahead and um, focused on learning what Juniper is, learn all about it. I watch videos. I would ask other people in my company, um, how do they learn Juniper just for just for advice. And uh, one thing that I like to do is whenever I learn a new sort of vendor for this particular case was Juniper, I would go ahead and verify um, and, and, and look at what the configuration differences are. So as we know as a network engineer, we spend a lot of time on the command line interface. And I wanted to make sure that the configurations that I'm that the configurations from Cisco and the configurations from Juniper have some similarities. And I went on uh, multiple forums and asked and looked for a list of configuration differences. So once I went there, I was playing around with, with Juniper and I spent some time learning. And as we know, when it comes to new technologies, in the beginning, it, it is it can be a little bit overwhelming, a little bit confusing. But the good news is with time and with repetition, the confidence in yourself is going to in increase in that particular vendor. And <laughs> After some time, I really enjoyed using Juniper. And in fact, I actually prefer Juniper now over Cisco. So it was kind of a, an interesting, interesting dichotomy where I was new into this technology and then less than six months, I was actually preferring the new technology. So as we know, as a network engineer or anywhere in tech, there is going to be new technologies that we have to deal with. And I want to make sure that I am able to understand them as quick as possible and, and just ask for help and advice from other individuals as well as looking at forums as well as just repetition and understanding that it is new take some time don't make any mistakes and ask questions and there is no dumb questions because it, a dumb question that gets that doesn't get asked eventually is going to be a dumb question um, later on so that's kind of how i do it and that's kind of how i would explain a uh, new technology so i'm curious do you guys have any new technologies that you guys are working on currently day to day is there anything new in this particular role um, I'm really intrigued about that. So that's kind of how I would answer that question. Um, another pretty simple question to answer, just talk about your experience um, about that. Or maybe if you don't have experience, talk about, I mean, this this should be easy for you guys to answer if you have no experience because you should have been labbing and lab, you could just talk about labbing and how that was all new to you. So uh, that's another good one. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. And by the way, if you guys are liking this type of content, let me know. Um, I'll make more videos like this. Um, so that's cool. All right, let's do one more. All right, let's do the last one. How do you prioritize issues when multiple network alerts or outages occur at once? Yes. So as a network engineer, there are multiple times where there are multiple different outages or multiple issues that I have to resolve at the same exact time. And obviously it's a little, a little bit inconvenient to deal with, but I have to understand that there is a priority that I have to follow. So, um, so there is a list of different types of tickets that I usually get. And some tickets are listed by either P1, P2. That's kind of like a Jira thing that we use for our ticketing queue. I'm not really sure what ticketing queue you guys are using, but based off the severity of the issue, I have to prioritize whichever one um, is, is the biggest. So for example, I like to prioritize issues that are higher level in the core in the, the architecture of the network. So if it's a core layer issue or you know a backbone layer issue, then I have to prioritize those over an access layer issue because the core layer issues they will go down and affect the other layers anyways. So that's why I like to prioritize that. And I also like to prioritize it based off the number of customers impacted, right? Because if, if two customers are impacted or 100,000 customers impacted, I'm going to look at the 100,000 customers impacted because as we know, you know, this is a corporation and working at a corporation, customers are 
what pays our bills. It's what's potentially going to hire me for this particular role. I want to make sure our customers are happy. And if 100,000 customers are upset about a particular issue, I want to make sure we're able to solve that issue as quickly as we possibly can. So I'm going to go ahead and, and solve that issue no matter what. So I would always pick the customer first and based off the severity of it. Um, and, and sometimes it can be hard to decipher the number of customers. So I would obviously ask my manager for assistance to make sure that I'm, I, this is the one that is the most severe, but it, it should be sort of common sense to, to really decide whichever one is the most severe one. But obviously that's kind of how I'd prioritize it. Um, if I do for those other ones that are also causing an outage if no one's attaining to it, attending to it, I would see if I can reach out to another fellow network engineer in my team or someone that I've worked with and ask them, hey, can you take away this particular issue just so they can sit with it and maybe come up with a resolution as I'm working with that new issue. So um, it is a g game of cat and mouse, but it's always the customer first. I always want to make sure the customer is happy. And if it's the number of customers impacted, also who the customer is, if it's a high paying customer, like a corporation, uh, like a B2B sort of scenario, then I want to make sure that 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 business is, is up and running or it's like a hospital or something's on the line where human life's at risk, like a hospital, then obviously that is the highest level of priority, no matter what is when someone's life is at risk. Obviously, we have to make sure that's a priority. Then after that, it's like the money of the business, whichever one is losing the most money, which are which is most likely the most customers. And after that, then we can go down the list. So it really just depends. Um, my question to you is, do you guys have any big outages that you're dealing with mul and multiple times? And do you have a big enough team to deal with multiple outages at the same time? Because uh, on our team, we do have multiple teams that can help out. So I'm curious you guys to see if you guys have anything like that. So that's kind of how I would answer that question. So like I said, you want to give a good level of detail. You want to be able to explain it in a good manner. You want to have really good eye contact. As you can see, um, as you can see, I'm wearing a suit. You want to, here's the thing guys, when it comes to interviewing and asking these technical questions, a lot of people say, I don't want to wear a suit. I don't want to dress nice. I don't want to get a haircut, but Hey, you're, this is your first impression. You want to give the right first impression, right? So that's why when you're answering these questions, if you're dressed well, you smile, you get, you're going to be in a good position. And that's kind of how I'd answer these behavioral technical, behavioral network engineering questions. We're going to do a technical one very soon, but this is how I'd go about answering them. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you guys want mentorship from me where I can show you exactly how to land a network engineering position in under six months, please book a call with me down below and you'll see a link in the description. And if you guys are interested, please go ahead and do that. If you guys like the video, please subscribe. And thank you guys so much for, for watching this video. I hope you guys have a good rest of your day and peace.